Good morning, everyone. Wow, it's great to look out from here and just see so many people here from the length and breadth of Scotland. Uh, and of course, it's great to attend Scotland's first ever rural parliament and perhaps the biggest ever gathering of grassroots rural activists the country has ever seen. So I'm really proud as cabinet secretary uh, and someone who takes a close interest in many of the issues you'll be discussing over these days to be here with you this morning. And of course, I'm told you're all very enthusiastic and keen, and I think if you're turning out for a ministerial speech at 8.30 in the morning, which is the earliest I've ever been asked to deliver, that is a sign that you are very keen and enthusiastic, so I'm encouraged by that. And last night was absolutely fantastic as well. By the time I got down from Parliament uh, and got here, I wasn't here for dinner uh, last night, but I, I know it went well, but I did make it in time for some of the culture and arts that was taking place last night right here to listen to local young musicians from Argyll, and the, the, the ballet was there and other acts, etc. And then, of course, it culminated with Karen Matheson, Donald Shaw, and James Grant from Love and Money, a band I went and saw in Glasgow about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, on the stage here, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I was just sitting there, and Karen Matheson was sit, uh, standing here singing A Fond Kiss at the end of the night, and I can only describe that as pure ecstasy. And I think she was singing it directly at me because I was just sitting there. So... <laughs> I really, I, really, I really enjoyed last night. I'm glad I made it in time to, to see that, that fantastic display of, of the arts and culture and everything that's very special about rural Scotland. And of course, gatherings like this do demonstrate something we already know, and that is how privileged we are to live somewhere as vibrant and as diverse as rural Scotland, and indeed as Scotland eh, as a country. So my job here, which I'm, I'm pleased to do, is to really set the scene for your really groundbreaking deliberations are now taking place over the next couple of days and, and see this, this parliament uh, deliver on its manifesto commitment in our government because I've been personally championing that for many, many years and it's great to see the rural parliament now becoming a living, breathing reality. It marks an exciting point as we join the family of rural parliaments from across the whole of Europe, sharing with millions of others the recognition of the importance of a rural voice and the pride that we do have in a rural way of life. And rural parliaments have proved themselves to be a fantastic vehicle for giving communities a strong presence and a voice on the national stage. So that's exactly what I'm expecting from the rural parliament here in Scotland, and I'm sure that will be true for Scotland as well. This meeting is the culmination of a, a tremendous amount of hard work by a lot of dedicated people, uh, and, and John referred to that briefly as well. So my thanks, my personal thanks, go to the voluntary board of Scottish Rural Action, the members of the Rural Parliament Advisory Forum, and the, to the community groups up and down the country who have all worked tirelessly to spread the word about the benefits of having this kind of initiative. Uh, most importantly, of course, my thanks go to all of you, without whom there would be no Rural Parliament, and there are people here from all walks of life, from the grassroots across rural Scotland, and there are many diverse experiences <coughs> and views, no doubt, on the way forward as well. So it's a real rich collection uh, of uh, human resources uh, here at this rural parliament uh, this week. In all my time as Minister for Rural Affairs, I've been totally awestruck by the fantastic energy and creativity of the people that I meet when I travel around rural Scotland. I'm also, of course, frustrated at how difficult it can be to harness all of that energy I come across and engage with the vast array of people involved. And of course, I've just explained what we have here today. And of course, there's many other thousands of people out there across rural Scotland uh, as well. So for the last few years in, in this post, I have been constantly searching for new and radical ways to take the pulse of grassroots Scotland. So I do think we've now found, hopefully, the answer to that. Rural Scotland covers 94% of our land area and is home to one-fifth of our population. And those of us who live and work here are aware of the many advantages that that can bring. The natural resources that we are blessed with, our land, our sea, our climate, they all underpin many of the great and moral class sectors that we have in this country, be that farming or fishing or food and drink or renewables and many other sectors as well. And some say, of course, that Scotland is a very lucky country because we've won the, the natural lottery. And I don't think I'd disagree with that. I'm sure you wouldn't do it as well. So we must do our absolute utmost to protect and utilise the amazing assets we do have in this country, and particularly in rural Scotland, the natural assets and the human assets as well. So some of these, dis these issues are being discussed later today in the workshops, and of course I'll be here hopefully for part of that, I'll be here for, for part of today. 
I know many of you have been involved in setting the agenda for this event online and via social media or at local events, like the one I was lucky enough to attend in my own constituency in Elgin. And I and some of my ministerial colleagues will, of course, be participating in the workshop sessions later today and the discussions tomorrow as well. I think it's really important we all take advantage of the opportunity to have a genuine debate about the issues that really matter to rural Scotland's future. We have to take this opportunity to influence each other, to generate ideas and develop solutions. And the video that was shown last night that many of you saw, interviewing people from various rural communities will throughout Argyle, uh, and one gentleman has said, of course, talking about the challenges of the future, he said that, that the solution, of course, is to get the ideas that allow us to move forward. And he was talking about that from his own personal experience. And again, that is what this event is about. And what better place to have uh, this debate taking place because this award-winning community-led le leisure centre is just one example, of course, of how people living in rural communities can affect real lasting and positive change. This is a community hub that provides a huge variety of facilities, including, of course, the water flumes. Even more importantly, though, the choice of the venue for this week was all about the community choosing somewhere that ensured the money spent over these four days would be reinvested locally and support the local economy. And many of you will have been out and about yesterday getting a taste of the rich diversity on their own doorstep here and many of the community initiatives in and around Oban. And many of you, of course, had the opportunity to visit Mull. Uh, and I hope the weather was good. I was actually there for my holiday just uh, the week before last, uh, and at a fantastic time. Uh, so it's an amazing place. And there, of course, we have the Anne Roth Community Enterprise Centre, which is a hub for community and business activity, and the home also to the Mall Abattoir. And that alone provides a crucial service to local farmers and allows locally produced animals to be slaughtered and eaten locally with all the benefits that brings to the wider local economy. So it's great again to see all these little bright lights of innovation around rural Scotland thriving and doing well. This confirms what I thought when I met with staff in Bond last year and discussed the Swedish rural parliament about how the best solutions come from grassroots action where local people develop their local solutions to local problems. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Staffan for all his time and support that he's mm. given to get us where we are today and 20 years ago, 20 years ago, Sweden had a vision for something new then, something different, a gathering of rural communities on a mass scale. And that vision was realized when the very first rural parliament was born and with it, the birth of a rural movement. So our friends in Sweden have never looked back and you know, that's what this rural parliament is all about, channeling ideas, connecting people, acting as an information hub and ultimately being a catalyst for change. But in all our deliberations, we must focus on the greatest asset of our rural areas, which is, as I said before, the people. Although you will no doubt debate a number of challenges facing rural areas today, you'll also hear about many, many success stories. Sharing both good and bad experiences enables us to learn what has worked well and avoid making the same mistakes. I've organized some events over the last few years. This is the biggest rural event, but I've been struck by how sometimes if you get people in the same room from different parts of the country that face the same challenges in their own communities and then they share experiences and some people can explain to other people how they overcome some of the obstacles they face locally and then other people can take away that experience and make it work in their own communities. And I, say that my, I see that in my own constituency uh, in Murray and I see that in my travels around Scotland. So that sharing of knowledge, skills and expertise is really, really important. It can help communities build confidence, resilience and get the outcomes they want to see for their future. And to help support that today, I'm also pleased to announce the doubling of funding for the Scottish Rural Network. We're going to increase the funding to four million pounds over the next six years, which is around, as I said, you know, double what it is at the moment. So we're very keen to support that agenda and that kind of interaction in the months and years going forward. That will greatly enhance the network and enable us to support initiatives such as the Rural Parliament and other similar initiatives in the times ahead. We have to make sure we can support and underpin rural development by sharing all that good practice and expertise. And I really want the network and the Rural Parliament to work closely in partnership to make the ideas that you're going to be discussing this week a reality in the future. And there are many, many examples of good collaboration. The network helped run the fantastic Celebrate Rural Scotland photo competition for this event. And you'll notice the six wonderful winning photographs on display outside the hall. It's also helped to promote the numerous local rural parliament events that have been taking place uh, around the country so far. 
So whilst innovation, ideas and energy will come from all of you and people like you, the government is absolutely committed to help providing the tools to capture all that's good and spread the word as far as wide as possible. But our commitment won't just stop at these kinds of things. <clears throat> We're absolutely committed as a government to take bold action across a range of policies for the benefit of rural Scotland. I know that amongst the many issues being discussed over the next couple of days, land reform may be at the forefront of your discussion. As you know, as a government, we are currently considering the proposals made by the Land Reform Review Group in May and are already taking forward a number of the recommendations. I believe this nation's land should be used to benefit the people and the environment of this country. Our communities and environment will thrive when communities and the people of Scotland have access to land to fulfil their aspirations and needs. And things are changing. The range of community ownership has widened in recent years. A report published by Community Land Scotland clearly shows that community ownership models work and work well. The turnover of the communities featured more than doubled and direct employment increased fourfold. The ones featured as well also increased their comp contributions to local economies by two and a half million pounds. So these outcomes demonstrate the power of community ownership. We want more communities to become stronger, more resilient and more independent through the acquisition and management of their lands. That is why we brought forward the Community Empowerment Bill, which will improve community planning, strengthen partnership working and provide a legal framework for communities to take ownership of land and buildings. <clears throat> I can't disclose what's going to be announced in the next few weeks. There's lots of things happening in the Scottish Parliament and at Scottish Government level over the next uh, couple of weeks uh, and soon thereafter. But what I can say is that land reform is an ongoing process. There's a range of work streams underway at the moment that are going to result in very radical outcomes. I can also say that I think land reform is going to dominate uh, much of Parliament's activities over the next year or two and no doubt beyond. But the timing for the first rural Parliament could not be better because Scotland is changing. In the build-up to the referendum, debates were happening in town halls, community centres and street corners. I recognise many familiar faces in the audience who were participating at the forefront of many of those public meetings uh, around Scotland. But the public showed an eagerness to take an active part in shaping their future. And that, of course, took many of us by surprise, pleasantly <laughs> amazed and surprised by the enormous, unprecedented public engagement and participation in our country's future. And what is equally amazing is that these discussions are continuing and we consider, uh, as we consider how best, for instance, to devolve more power to Scotland. So this rural parliament must build on this enthusiasm and take an active role in the ongoing debate. We need to have a coherent and complete set of economic and social levers to help tackle many of the complex issues you'll be discussing in relation to rural poverty or economic growth uh, in rural Scotland over this couple of days. You know, for instance, with a greater say in competition regulation, we could ensure a fairer deal for rural communities and essential services such as parcel delivery or high-speed mobile phone or broadband coverage, enormous issues in rural Scotland. And indeed, last night again in the video from Argyll interviewing various people from around the, the local communities, I remember uh, the lady saying that uh, the internet was a lifesaver for rural communities, particularly in relation to employment opportunities. So now we have the Smith Commission underway and is currently considering what additional powers should be controlled in Scotland. The Scottish Government, of course, has argued, as you won't be surprised to learn, that these powers should be extensive and they should be guided by the presumption that devolution should take place unless there are clear reasons where responsibility should remain reserved. And I know many of you and some of you will be involved in other organisations have made really strong representations to the Commission. So I'm delighted that you're taking that opportunity to influence Scotland's future. This is a historic moment in our constitutional journey and we should not lose sight of the many things that we're already doing and the powers we do have, but we are still have the opportunity to shape the future. But we do have a lot of things that are underway and happening at the moment. And of course, just in the last few days, we've seen the Health Secretary announce uh, an additional £40 million, pounds, for instance, of funding for our health services, empowering GPs and primary care professionals to develop initiatives that address challenges in workload and health inequalities, specifically targeted at rural areas uh, and deprived areas. But we can and we, could, we should do more. So I want to work with all of you to foster new ideas and new ways of working to ensure that rural Scotland thrives. That is why this rural parliament is so, so important. 
Your enthusiasm, your commitment, your drive is absolutely vital to its success and, of course, to achieving a successful rural Scotland. We have to build on the momentum generated through the referendum and embed that notion of participatory democracy. This, I believe, will help us build a, a real, genuine rural movement for Scotland. The vision, I'm sure we share it. We want to see a thriving rural Scotland, a great quality of life, a, a thriving rural economy, communities where young people in particular feel they've got the choice to live and work in those communities and continue to build their lives there and are not forced to leave, and where these communities are empowered to shape their own destinies and their own future. So I wish you very well in the coming day and two days, and I look forward to working with you all very much, uh, hopefully, in the future as well. And just to close, I would just say that, again, the young musicians last night on the stage were outstanding, and they culminated uh, with uh, young Laura McLeod singing the Brand New Road, the song Brand New Road, which I thought was outstanding. So it's an appropriate title for the song, and it's an appropriate thought to leave hanging in our heads this morning as well, a brand new road, because this is the first ever rural parliament in Scotland, it's the biggest ever gathering of rural activists in Scotland, and we are embarking on a brand new road. So good luck with that journey, and I'll support you, and the government will support you along that journey in the times ahead. Thank you very much. <clears throat>